Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Rice. I'm the membership coordinator here at Freedom of the Press Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Caitlin Vogus, who can introduce my other colleagues and get us started. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks so much, Ryan, and hi, welcome everybody. Um, we really appreciate you joining for our event tonight, which is in honor of Student Press Freedom Day. So I'd like to wish you all a happy Student Press Freedom Day and also thank the Student Press Law Center for organizing Student Press Freedom Day. We're really excited to be a part of it. Our topic tonight is called Data-Driven Coverage of Press Freedom, and we are planning to have a short discussion between me and Emma Flannery, who is a student journalist and also the editorial intern at Freedom of the Press Foundation, before we turn it over to Stephanie Sugars, who is our senior reporter for the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, to do a little presentation to teach folks how to use the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker to report on press freedom violations. And I will let Stephanie explain more about what the uh, U.S. Press Freedom Tracker is when it's her turn in the segment. But we're really excited tonight to host this conversation, and thank you again for joining us. Um, so I'd like to invite my colleague, Emma, to um, join me. Emma is a junior at the University of Missouri School of Journalism and a student journalist. Last fall, she covered homelessness, health, and higher education for the Columbia Missourian. And this semester, she's an editorial intern for the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker at Freedom of the Press Foundation, where she reports on press freedom violations in the United States. And I suppose I should also briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Caitlin Bogus. I'm the Deputy Director of Advocacy at Freedom of the Press Foundation, where I work on issues related to press freedom for journalists and also protection for sources and whistleblowers. Uh, so Emma, tonight we're here to talk about documenting press freedom violations. And I wanted to ask you about your experience with that from the perspective of a student journalist. I know we've talked about um, an experience you had last spring or in the spring of 2023 when you were reporting on the eviction of unhoused residents in one of Columbia's largest homeless encampments. Can you tell us a little bit about your reporting on that and then what happened uh, as you were trying to report on that issue? Um, so that was reporting that I did as part of one of the papers that is in my college town, the Columbia Missourian. Um, and like Caitlin said, I have done, I was doing a lot of, uh, homelessness reporting throughout that semester. Um, and we had the, I was report, I was working with another reporter and myself, and we had spent several weeks and months, um, really building a relationship with some of the people that, uh, we talked about in our stories, especially when it came to that, um, eviction situation. Uh, and we had spent a lot of time at that site. Um, and when the day of the eviction came, myself, the other reporter, um, and a photographer were all there. We knew going in that it was going to be a little bit of a emotional situation in, in many ways. And we wanted to be respectful of that. Um, uh, but we also knew it was going to be a little bit testy. We had a feeling that some people would not be happy that we were there. And that was accurate. Um, once we got there, we parked in a parking spot and we were told that we couldn't park in that parking spot. And then we were confined to one little part of the encampment and we were being constantly watched uh, by volunteers, by members of law enforcement. We were not allowed to move. Um, and I will say to give credit where credit is due, our photographer took a lot of the initiative um, in kind of respectfully pushing those boundaries as best as as we could to get the best story that we could and do what we could do for the people that we were profiling and that we were focusing on in the story. Um, so it was definitely a bit of an unusual experience kind of figuring out how to break break rules and that we didn't feel were very just, um, which can kind of feel a little counterintuitive, especially as students when you're when you're taught to always follow certain rules. Um, so that was my kind of first experience with law enforcement, um, really having a a real impact, <clears throat> excuse me, on my reporting. Um, they spoke very negatively towards us. They yelled at us many times. Uh, specifically, our photojournalist was threatened to be arrested many, many times. Um, and props to him and his bravery that he kept going and he kept trying to get the best shot that he could. And those are really, really gorgeous pictures that he got. So I would say it was worth it. <clears throat> but yeah, that was kind of my experience there. And it was it was definitely interesting, especially because at the time I was 
18 years old. So it was a little, it was a little odd in a good way. I would say it was a learning experience. Yeah, I think that would be intimidating for any journalist or professional journalist, let alone a student journalist. I guess I'm wondering, as a student journalist, was it something you felt like you were prepared for when you went into the situation? Did you, you know, you mentioned you anticipated it would be testy and a difficult situation. Were you worried about the police specifically and trying to restrict your reporting? Or was it a surprise to you when the officers actually tried to restrict from where you could report? Yeah, we were, um, we were prepared for like I said, definitely some pushback specifically from law enforcement. Um, we, the team of editors at the Missourian did a really great job about having multiple meetings with us to make sure that we were prepared in case something did happen or we were detained. We knew exactly what we would have, we would have had to do in that situation. Um, so in that regard, I felt very lucky that I had a whole team of people, not with me, not only with me, but also back at the newsroom that had my back and were making sure that we were safe and were consistently checking in with us. Um, so I would say we were as prepared as we possibly could be, but also when you're in that situation, it's very hard to know what to do because you're not only worrying about your own safety and well-being as a private citizen, but also how best to fulfill your duties as a journalist. So kind of navigating that uh, balance was very, very interesting for me. Sure. And I'm wondering, after the fact, did you write about that experience as part of your reporting on the homeless encampment sweep? And if so, why did you decide to write about it? And if not, why didn't you write about it? Yeah, I did not. Honestly, it didn't even cross my mind that it was something um, to write about or to really talk about outside of just telling my newsroom friends like, oh, my gosh, this is so crazy that this happened to this group and I. Um and I think a lot of it was driven by the fact that we didn't want to take away from the importance of the story that we were telling, because at the end of the day, it was not about us. Um, so I think that's really where a lot of it uh, came from. But also, I just think that speaking for myself as a student journalist, a lot of the times I feel like, well, I'm not like a real journalist. So, you know, I can't really, I, I shouldn't say anything because I'm not really important enough uh, to be talking about this. But I think looking back, I wish I wish I had known about the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker um, because I think it's important to talk about these things and student journalism is incredibly important. And I know what we were doing that day was very important. Um, so just to be able to shed light on that, I wish, you know, we had I had known to talk about it. Um, but in the moment, no, we did not nobody ever thought that it was something that really should be discussed. That's so interesting and, and unfortunate from my perspective, because I think you're right, it does matter to speak out about these issues, to document these issues like the Press Freedom Tracker does, but also just as journalists yourselves to document them um, and to make people aware in your community. Because when you speak out, it's, you know, it's not just about the rights of journalists, right? It's also about the rights of everyone who's relying on your reporting to stay informed about their communities. And I think something I've seen um, from my perspective as the deputy director of advocacy at Freedom of the Press Foundation is what a big difference it makes when the news media writes about press freedom violations to the ultimate outcome of those issues and violations. And so one really good example of that was from last summer when there was the police raid on a newsroom in Marion County, Kansas. There was this kind of immediate national outcry over the raid and so many journalists wrote about it and it got so much coverage. And I think that really contributed to the police eventually belatedly backing down. The police chief had to resign. The city was, uh, is doing an investigation. And so like the spotlight that journalists can bring to these issues, we see it. Journalists understand how powerful that spotlight is when it comes to things outside of press freedom. You know, they write about things and they can see the effect. And it's interesting that sometimes they're reluctant to turn that spotlight on themselves and press freedom issues because it really does make a difference um, to everybody's right to know and not just to the press's right to know. Yeah, I think just to add on to what you said, a lot of times journalists are taught that it's it's not about you and you're just kind of supposed to be the subjective third party observer. And I personally am very glad that that is kind of changing and the definition of what a journalist is and what they do is kind of changing. Um, just because like you said, it can be very difficult when you're in situations that do violate the First Amendment 
you know, when you're always taught, like, I'm not supposed to be a part of the story, it's just very difficult to know what to do in that situation. So it's very interesting. Yeah. You mentioned that you had met with your editors, that you were prepared uh, in the event that you were arrested, what you would have to do. And so it sounds like your newsroom is one that talked about press freedom issues, at least internally. I'm wondering if, you know, outside of this one experience, if there were other press freedom issues that you talked about as a newsroom and, and strategized around or things that your colleagues told you they encountered and what other press freedom issues might have come up um, in your experience in the newsroom? Yeah, so that was really my only personal experience with um, a press freedom aggression of that nature. Um, one of the silver linings of reporting out of a state like Missouri is that there is a lot of political turbulence that often affects the press. Um, so I do know, I think it was a couple months prior or a year prior um, that the governor of Missouri had sued our newspaper for uh documents and emails pertaining to him and anything that included his name in it. So kind of a reverse use of a FOIA, um, which was very interesting. We've seen that pop up a couple times now across the United States. Um, so yeah, that was a big one. I remember people were talking about that for a really long time. Um, I think the biggest issue that we consistently run into is access to information. Um, whether it be through freedom of information requests or just in speaking with public information officers. Um, and again, as a student journalist, I think it can be very difficult to learn how to advocate for yourself and think of yourself as, you know what, I am just as important as a professional journalist and I am, you know, I deserve to take up just as much space. Um, so especially when you're talking to people that are so much older than you, um, and somebody tells you, no, I, I'm not going to give you access to this document or this records request, or I'm, a lot of the time we would have people delay the time that it would take for them to give us those documents. Um, so it can be very difficult to tell somebody, you know, twice your age, kind of to stand up for yourself and like, and that dynamic. Um, but I always do find it kind of cool when we have situations like that, because it almost makes it makes us feel like, oh, yeah, we are we are real journalists and we are fighting for the First Amendment and we are pro-democracy. So it's kind of cool in a in a weird, sad way. Yeah, nothing makes you feel more like a real journalist than having to fight with a pu public records custodian. Yeah. <laughs> yes, very true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I, I know we, we hopefully have some student journalists in the audience, so I'm sure some of them have had their own press freedom issues that they've encountered. I know ones that um, we talk a lot about are things around high school journalists, especially in the control and interference that the administration can um, pose to their reporting. And I know Student Press Law Center has their new voices campaign where they're trying to enact laws around the country to um, enshrine protections for student journalists at the high school level and also protect their advisors. And then another issue that's been popping up a lot lately is um, harassment and intimidation of student journalists, even from other students. Um, so as student journalists are covering some of the hot button issues on campus, including things like campus protests, even that can be a, a dangerous or a scary environment for student journalists who are reporting. And so I think, um, you know, all the things you're saying, Emma, are things that both professional journalists and student journalists encounter. And you mentioned a couple of times, you know, feeling young, feeling like you're not a real reporter when you're a student journalist and things like that, but you are. And so just, I wanna encourage the student journalists in the audience to take it seriously when they encounter these types of press violations and, and really um, think about them. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit um, also about your work for the US Press Freedom Tracker. So this semester you're the editorial intern and I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your reporting for the tracker and maybe one of the more interesting or important stories that you've reported on this semester. Yeah, um, the great thing about working with the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker is every story or incident is so different and so complicated and so, so multifaceted. Um, so honestly, I feel like every time I get a new incident, I tell myself, oh, this is crazier than the last one or more complicated than the last one was. Um, but specifically within my capacity as an intern, I I usually just deal with um, incidents. So whenever we get something either through our tip line, through social media, through 
the news there are other people reporting on it um typically i will take that incident research it do some interviews typical reporting and write up an article just putting it in context and like you would any traditional news story um and then it gets uploaded into the database um i recently did a story about kind of similar to what i was talking about when the governor of missouri sued our newsroom um using the foia that happened again in louisiana but if anybody knows anything about Louisiana politics and Louisiana law, it's very, very complicated and very bureaucratic. Um, so it was just a lot of legal documents um, and a lot of back and forth and personal disagreements and uh, different readings of constitutional amendments. Um, so that was very complicated to get through. It was very difficult to get through. It took multiple rounds of edits and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, like I said, they're all so interesting. I mean, there was a radio tower in Alabama that recently just literally vanished. Like there's no trace of it. There's no debris. There's no nothing. Um, so I can't even really say that there's just one that sticks out to me because they're all so unique in their own way. Yeah. And if folks want to learn more, they should check out the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker. Stephanie will be demoing it um, in a few minutes and we'll drop a link to it in the chat as well. Um, but just before we turn it over to Stephanie, I wanted to ask one more question, Emma, which is what advice would you give to a student journalist or even a professional journalist who's considering a, a writing about a press freedom violation or something they've encountered in their reporting, but, you know, is hesitant or doesn't know how? What would you tell them? What advice would you give them? Um, I mean, I think I can speak definitely more directly to student journalists, but I guess for anybody, I would just advocate for yourself. Don't be afraid to make yourself the story if it's if it's needed. Um, keeping journalism alive sometimes requires that journalists turn the lens back on themselves. Um, so I would definitely say speak up for yourself, know your rights, be educated on what a press aggression looks like. Um, and as Stephanie will tell you, it looks like a bunch of different things that you might not even know about. Um, so continue to speak up for yourself, continue to advocate for yourself, document everything, take photos, take videos. I'm sure many of you already know that, but yeah. That's great advice. Well, thanks so much, Emma. We really appreciated hearing from you and thanks for your work this semester. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely. I'm going to introduce my colleague, Stephanie. So Stephanie Sugars is the senior reporter for the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, where she documents press freedom violations in the U.S. and by U.S. officials abroad. She's a graduate of NYU's Global and Joint Program Studies Program in Journalism and International Relations, and she previously worked at the Committee to Protect Journalists and the Post-Conflict Research Center, as well as a freelance reporter. And tonight, she's going to tell us more about the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker and how to use it for your reporting on press freedom violations. So Stephanie, over to you. Hi all, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is really going to just be an exploration of what is the tracker and how can you use it both to answer some of those questions that Emma mentioned about what is a press freedom violation and then how can you report on these issues more broadly if you don't want to solely center yourself and your experiences. So give me one second and we're off. So the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker is a news database. So as Emma mentioned, we will write articles um, the same way that any other journalist will. Uh, but what sets us apart is we also collect metadata about those incidents that we use to contextualize the events and find patterns that might be taking place across the country. So we document across 11 different categories um, that range from arrests and assaults to equipment seizure or damage to border stops where border authorities search your electronic devices because they're allowed to do that or uh, question you about your work or your sources. Along that same vein, there are subpoenas and other forms of prior restraint and a, a whole slew of things. So on our website, uh, the database can be sorted along a variety of sort of axes. Uh, the first and foremost is those categories, which you'll see here on the left. Um, you can also look at it geographically or by a particular date. Now, uh, this is the, the landing page. And so there's a lot of different filters that you can use here to look at things, but where it gets into the nitty gritty are in our blogs where we uh, analyze 
the various trends that we are seeing or uh, particular themes that we're focusing on, such as this year's election cycle to the incidents that are individually documented. And then you can dive in on a particular category. And what's great about each of these landing pages for the categories is it not only describes what is included and counted in that category and includes the methodology of how we document, but also gives you an idea here on the left of different queries that you can run to, as sort of a jumping off point for whatever sort of research you might be doing. So to, for example, the journalists who are still facing charges, we just documented a new uh, journalist charged today. Uh, the indictment was un unsealed yesterday, but so you'll see that we have this, uh, it's filtered by category and then by the status of the charges. So each category will have its own sort of internal specific metadata that you can search by. So you can look at uh, any, any individuals who were issued charges without actually being placed under arrest. Uh, but you can also uh, search across multiple categories at the same time, or boo, 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 uh, you can uh, look at this sort of overarching metadata of by date, by location, the journalist or outlet that was targeted, or we have these really convenient tags here. So in terms of something that uh, Emma's story that she told about her experience at the encampment, we've actually found that police are often hostile while uh, doing encampment sweeps. And so we have now 30 different incidents since 2017 where journalists have been arrested or assaulted, typically sometimes equipment seized or damaged uh, while they were documenting these sorts of encampments. But we also have uh, themes around the individuals involved. So nearly 40 journalists were students who were reporting for their student outlet or as an independent freelancer uh, while in school who we've seen are filling these gaps in their local news coverage and taking on a lot of the same stories and therefore a lot of the same risks as their professional counterparts. And going back into some of the sort of explorations that you can do across multiple data points or categories or using some of this metadata, um, on top of mind for a lot of us this year, as mentioned, is the election. And so we have an overarching election tag, but it also breaks down by election season. Uh, predominantly just the presidential election years. So you can look specifically at, well, what was going on with the 2016 election? What sort of incidents happened then? And then how did that compare to 2020? And now that we're entering this season, uh, what does it look like now this year? And so the last sort of thing that I, will, I wanna make sure that everyone is aware of is this download data set. Uh, drop down here, which is to our API. So you can download the full data set, or let's say you're interested in people who were arrested and assaulted and had their equipment damaged all at the same time. There are 24 of them, and you can download that specific filtered data as well and use all of that information to really winnow in on uh, whether there is a pattern with a particular court that is prone towards allowing subpoenas of journalists or whether a particular police department uses kettling, which is a technique where they encircle a crowd and typically execute mass arrests. Uh, is there a particular department that is using that technique more often than another or is using it indiscriminately to arrest journalists without providing any sort of ability for them to avoid that detainment. And so uh, the last thing, as mentioned, uh, we I, I think it has been shared in the chat, and if not, it will be. Uh, we are more than happy to speak with anyone about uh, the research that we do, the database that's and the information that it contains to help you find the specific information that you are looking for to double check that you've queried using the database 
as effectively as possible or otherwise answer any questions that you may have um, and that you can reach out to us at media at pressfreedomtracker.us or to me directly at stephanie at freedom.press uh, to answer any sort of questions that you may have. Uh, I think the last sort of thing that I'll point to, uh, exploring a bit more what I mentioned before, are these analysis pieces that we do. And there are a few consistent ones that we'll do every year, uh, namely our arrest report, and then this politics and the press rolling blog of press freedom incidents that take place at campaign events, because even though campaign events are private and uh, candidates are allowed really to do whatever they want because they're a private event, we think it can be indicative of how they might act if they are elected into office. And so we will document those and, and cross-document them if it fits one of our other categories. But if you are interested in exploring what sort of trends are happening but you don't really know where to start. Uh, the, our monthly newsletter uh, can be a great starting point or inspiration, um, as can our uh, arrest reports uh, that come out every year. And so I know that I may have sped through some things a bit much. And so I very much am interested in what sort of questions you might have for me or the database generally about how to use this system or uh, any other sort of topics that interest you about our work or how it can help inform your own reporting. Stephanie, can I ask a question while members of our audience are maybe thinking of their questions? Please. Um, so we were just talking with Emma about students who experience press violations, and you showed us the tag on the tracker that documents student journalists. I guess I'm wondering, like, how do you find out about those incidents? Um, and if there was a student who experienced something and they weren't sure if it qualified for the tracker, um, how do you kind of vet the incidents? And is it okay for people to reach out to you about like edge cases? Yeah, absolutely. So just to get to a point of, uh, so <laughs> a lot of questions in there and I'll try to address each of them in turn and please chime in if I've, if I've missed one. But so we find out about incidents typically through three different means. The first is through someone submitting a tip. Uh, and that is always what we're sort of hoping for because we know that journalists don't like to be the center of the story. And so they'll often not report something in their own news outlet because of this uh, sense that it puts them in the center of the story, that it deprioritizes the story that they were originally covering. Um, and so if, an, if a journalist tells us directly about it, it can sort of short circuit that impulse so that you don't have to be the one reporting it yourself. Uh, oftentimes, if they don't reach out to us directly, we might catch it if you post about it on social media. And then lastly, if a journalist does uh, talk about it or publish something about it, we have a complicated system of Google alerts uh, that we use to identify cases. So we have these 11 categories. You asked about how we vet things. So if you fit our definition of a journalist, it is a very broad definition. Uh, student journalists absolutely count. And the main things that we are interested in and are verifying are that you were engaged in an act of journalism when the incident took place or it was in retaliation for journalism you had done, uh, that you actively self-identify as a journalist, and that there is some history of collecting work and for dissemination to the public. So engaging in those acts of journalism. And so once we verify that, we see if it fits into any of our categories. So uh, each one has its own sort of stipulations of what takes place. So denials of access have to be to government events where there is a First Amendment guarantee for Open Meetings Act requests or issues uh, where, let's say, 
all of a sudden your city council says, no, we're going to have a private executive session for no reason, or we aren't going to allow you onto the media list anymore because we don't think you're a real journalist and we don't like what you've been reporting. Both of those would fall under that category. Um, but it can be sort of finicky. And if you're not as enmeshed in this world, uh, it, it may not be clear. So absolutely welcome people reaching out uh, for any additional information, or if you just aren't sure whether something happened was or was not a, an issue. Uh, one category that I didn't mention, but where a lot of these sort of things end up playing out is in the other category, especially for students when at the high school level, student journalists simply unfortunately do not have the same rights and protections as even college uh, journalists do. So if your high school newspaper demands that they have prior review over anything that you might publish, that is something that we would document here under our other category because they can technically do that, but it doesn't mean it's not alarming. It doesn't mean that it's not a press freedom aggression as far as we are concerned. And so a whole slew of different things end up in this category. Uh, often it's harassment, uh, which we will only document once an arrest has been made or charges have been filed because as many of us unfortunately know, harassment is rampant. Uh, so every case of online harassment or even physical harassment is not something that we are able to document. Now, if it crosses that threshold into being assault, which can even include an actionable threat of harm, if someone is standing near you and threatening to hurt you, that is an assault as well. Um, so we just strongly encourage anyone to reach out if you've experienced something that just felt off or wrong. Did I answer all of the questions? I may yes. have asked something. Yes, thanks. Mark. Any questions from our audience? Not seeing any currently. But I did put our emails up, both mine and Stephanie's, and we'll be sure to monitor that. Perfect. It, though I will warn you, if you send me an email right now, I will not see it. <laughs> but I'll get back to you as soon as I am able to. Um, another thing that I want to invite anyone watching, uh, including my fellow participants uh, or panelists, uh, is if you have any queries that you would like to see run through the database so you can get an idea of what sort of information may or may not exist. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Otherwise, I'll just start poking around about the things that are most amusing or interesting to me. I know it, amusing might be a little weird to say, uh, but for example, uh, in seven full years of documentation now, the tracker has never documented an incident in Wyoming which is just bizarre to me and my sort of my white whale at this point, uh, but happy to sort of explore any sort of trends or issues uh, that you are interested in. Um, given that this is an election year, um, I think the tracker started in response or after the 2016 election. Um, so this is the, I guess, just the second election cycle, presidential election cycle. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything you're looking forward to? Obviously we don't, we're not excited uh, when press freedom incidences happen. Um, is there anything that you're now seeing a trend um, going into the second election cycle? Yeah, so I'm act I'll am i actually tell the story real fast of how the tracker was founded. And one of the very first incidents that we documented was an assault by a politician, Greg Gianforte, uh, who uh, attacked a BBC reporter named Ben Roberts, I believe, and uh, who was just trying to ask him a question inside the state house. And I believe in Montana. And uh, following a settlement agreement that they reached uh, after Gianforte was 
charged, uh, he agreed to pay $50,000 specifically to the Committee to Protect Journalists, which was earmarked as sort of the seed money for the tracker. And so our, our origin point is in politicians being aggressive towards the press. And so Gianforte ended up subsequently winning an election despite that assault. Uh, but election years are always tempestuous, I think is the best descriptor. Uh, some of the most aggressive inc uh, single day incidents that we found were Donald Trump's inauguration on January 20th of 2017, wherein I believe something like 30 journalists were arrested or assaulted that day uh, while documenting demonstrations uh, to January 6th of 2021, which I need not tell any of you <laughs> what happened that day. But so in the election years themselves, we see a whole range of incidents taking place. Uh, let me pull up a sampling. So it ranges from a lot of these recent ones that we've documented are still the fallout from the January 6th uh, demonstrations, riots, uh, insurrection, and uh, where a lot of journalists who were documenting that day have been ordered to testify or turn over their footage. Uh, Newsmax and Fox have been subpoenaed for their journalists' communications around what they did or did not believe about the reports they were making. Uh, but we also have things like this, where a, the, a hotly debated mayoral race in Tennessee, in the, the town of Franklin, uh, ended up in a journalist being assaulted while trying to cover a mayoral forum because of just the outright hostility towards members of the press. And so in 2020, there was absolutely that level of hostility uh, already sort of enmeshed from years of Donald Trump's rhetoric while in office, uh, calling the press the enemy of the people, uh, singling out individual journalists at that and giving them his snarky nicknames to uh, the sort of sweeping statements about how libel laws should be opened up, whatever that meant was meant to be, or uh, that I, he removed all of the federal government subscriptions that were uh, to the New York Times and Washington Post, I believe, of retaliatory contact like that. And what we've seen is things that have taken place at the, the federal or presidential level often have this trickle down effect where local politicians feel emboldened to engage in that same sort of retaliatory conduct or to close off access to reporters because they have this sort of guidebook or at the very least sort of permission because if the president was allowed to get away with it without political consequences then why can't they uh another so we haven't seen a whole lot yet this election year uh other outside of campaign event restrictions which are documented in that uh, rolling blog that i mentioned earlier but i am Unfortunately, not expecting that to remain the case. I would not, I we are preparing for the fall to be tumultuous. Uh, and I am particularly preparing for January of next year because in both of the most recent presidential elections, it was in January in the fallout of the election that we saw some of the worst abuses. So that's that's where my eyes are focused. Stephanie, I wonder you showed us the student journalism tag. Um, could you show us ways that it's possible to drill down deeper on that? Is can you tell like are there particular geographic areas that are the worst offenders when it comes to student journalists, or in the types of categories, which ones are most common when it comes to student journalists? How like what can we glean from the tracker? Is is there something we can glean just 
going deeper beyond just the tag of student journalism. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that our filters do is once you put this filter in place, you'll see on the left hand side, the totals for each. So you can see that the most common, unfortunately, is assault, uh, followed by other uh, with that being a lot of the high school and middle school level uh, sort of restrictions and putting in place of uh, prior review or with threats to or firing of the journalism advisors. A lot of those end up in that other category. And then we have arrests and subpoena legal orders. Um, and a lot of these end up stemming from, as I mentioned earlier, student journalists are stepping into the breach to pick up where their professional counterparts have been unable to continue reporting. Uh, Emma may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the Mizzou students are more or less the only continuous uh, news coverage of what is happening in the Missouri State House. No, the Kansas State House. No, Missouri. I'm losing my mind. Um, Missouri. Yes. <laughs> Missouri. I don't know if we're the only continuous coverage. I do know that there are some local TV stations that uh, do some coverage in Jeff City, which is the state capital for those who don't know. Um, but I would say at least as it pertains to Columbia, we are the large, the Missourian at least is the largest uh, print newspaper and it's the most consistent newspaper. It's there are oh it's partly staffed by students so there are always staff members um which is great so it's very consistent coverage and it also covers the capital and I would probably say it's the biggest newspaper yeah. maybe minus the Kansas City Star that covers the capital I think I think the student newspaper runs a wire service that ends up being picked up by a lot of other outlets in the state I can yeah so. yeah the Missourian is interesting because it's not a student newspaper. It's staffed by students, but it's run by professional editors. Um, so, but there is also a student run newspaper, The Man Eater, which I was an editor at, which is really great. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's kind of interesting. We do have a wire service and we also are on the same wire service as many others. So we have some coverage for everything. Um, so it's kind of, it's like in the in-between of a student newspaper and a professional newspaper. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Awesome. Um, thank you for sharing and for, for humoring and correcting me. Um, so you can look across the categories, other ways to drill down, Caitlin, you had asked. Um, another really useful way is by cross-filtering by with multiple tags as well. So we have this overarching protest tag. And the one thing that has been consistent across all of the trackers documentation is that protests are the most dangerous place to be on assignment in the US. Uh, and that is that is reflected as it is in the entire database. So it is here with our student journalists who are covering docu and documenting these uh, demonstrations ranging from the protests in 2020 around the murder of George Floyd to more recent protests in regards to the Israel-Gaza war. Uh, and so uh, I, I, it, it is harder to say if there's particular jurisdictions that are more likely to be engaging in aggressions against student journalists. It's more having to do with what are the more dangerous zones generally? Uh, so Minnesota was a lot and California was a lot in 2020. Um, but those were some of the places where we were seeing the highest numbers of protests, the highest numbers of journalists of any level uh, being arrested or assaulted or having equipment seized. But I think what's important to sort of note here is that being a student doesn't exempt you from some of the targeting that we have seen. So for example, there were uh, students out of the Harvard Crimson newspaper who found some documents uh, in a trash can, I think a little bit off campus uh, that 
were rev revelatory about, uh, I believe, corruption that was happening or interpersonal dynamics with some of the staff members on campus. And when they published about these uh, papers that they had found, they found themselves targeted with subpoenas. The newspaper overall, as well as the reporter who found and did the reporting and the editor. And uh, just because you are a student doesn't mean the full force of the law will not be brought down upon you. And that's why it's so important to know what your rights are, to know what does constitute oppressed freedom aggression, uh, and to know what some of those best practices that Emma mentioned are and to have the support of not only your newsroom, but your faculty advisor and organizations like the Student Press Law Center and Freedom of the Press Foundation. Stephanie, I have a question um, I thought of while you were talking. Uh, I know it's in our name, the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, uh, hints at being domestic. Um, you brought up an incident where journalists could be arrested covering a, a rally for journalists killed in Gaza. Um, mm -hmm. What are our partner orgs doing internationally um, while, while we kind of cover domestic stuff? Yeah, so we, uh, Ryan is right that we only document press freedom aggressions in the US with the small asterisk there being incidents that involve US officials abroad. So there were a couple of cases uh, during the Trump administration where there were restrictions on press access to joint events that he was doing while abroad um, that were initiated by his office. So those were documented or uh, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection has functionally satellite operations in a couple of countries where they have these preclearance locations where uh, they basically are able to operate wholesale as they would in the US. And so we have a few border stops that are also technically abroad. Um, but our partner organizations, chief among them Reporters Without Borders and the Committee to Protect Journalists, both do a, an, an excellent job of keeping track of the major press freedom aggressions that are taking place internationally. Uh, both have a, a somewhat higher focus on arrests um, violent assaults and murders, uh, because with an, the entire world as your focus, uh, it's harder to get to the level of granularity that we are able to manage here at the tracker. Uh, but they are documenting uh, and verifying incidents internationally. Uh, and it's them who you'll want to turn to if you're looking for confirmation of the number of journalists who have been in killed killed in Gaza or Palestine or as in connection with that conflict so far, uh, hopefully no more, but unfortunately. Anyway, um, I think that number is already at 84, um, but they're also similarly keeping track of the number of assaults and murders of journalists everywhere. Name uh, comes to mind Mexico, which has historically been one of the most, like the most dangerous non-conflict zone for journalists in the world. Well, I don't see any other questions. Again, feel free to submit questions if you have any to membership at freedom.press or directly to Stephanie at Stephanie at freedom.press. Um, I wanna thank all of our panelists, Emma, Caitlin, and Stephanie. Thank you so much for describing the very important work you do. Um, thank you all so much for, for leading this. Thank you for having us and thank you all for joining us. Thank you guys for joining.